What's next? No, Bible study. We're reading Amos is our next book. Very good. Very good. What, where is that? In the Bible. No, I mean, the Bible study is here. It's one of these houses. On the very other. good. Very good. It, it's, it's, if you read it against the 8th century background of northern Israel, it is shocking. It's shocking. Right. Yeah. If you read it just with what we have to read it with, it's not so shocking. But in, in that reading against that background, it was amazing. We'll talk about why, why, why it was remembered. Because he was rejected, you know. He was thrown out of town. Right. Well, that's not in the face of prophets, it's not. All right. Truth, and threatened, and threatened with murder. And <laughs> so the question is, why are they in the canon? Because well, they were rejected. The book we're currently reading is Job, which is even more challenging. Why is that in the canon? The book of Job. We're currently reading the book of Job. Yes, I know, yes. Which is, and why is that in the canon? Yes, it's always, it's always interesting to ask that question. Why in the world would they keep this one? Right. Well, we'll be talking about that. Do we begin or what? Well, it's an honor to be here with a dear friend, Jim Sanders. He and I go back to 1995, when he was part of a search committee that was looking for a priest for Christ Church in Ontario. And he came to Arcadia, where I was serving as an interim, along with four other distinguished fellows all over six feet tall. And so I, he was one of the posse who, who were looking for a priest. And so I served as rector of Christ Church uh, until 2016. Uh, so one of the great joys has been over those years to have conversations with Jim uh, once a month or more often in his study um, to become familiar with the ideas that, that he's been teaching all over the years. So you've had a word about Jim, and uh, there's so much more that can be said, but he's got the better words. We keep a we keep a bottle of Bush Mills just for his visits. <laughs> can I make a suggestion? We can move forward. And uh, I think the title of this may have been a little intimidating for people. It'll probably straggle in, but <laughs> it's all right. And I usually leave early, so don't be one. So many of the basic things are in the handouts. I understand that you have the handouts. Of that, and it, uh, that those you can read for yourselves, um, and uh, there's sort of a foundation thinking for what we're doing. Um, I would like for you to to uh, get out the list of canons. This one. Uh, if you, these are these are. Um, uh, lists of the canons of six different current Christian communities, uh, of, of rather five Christian communities. One on the left is the Jewish canon or the Tanakh, and uh, and then uh, you, you could compare how they go. If you notice that all six of them have the Pentateuch as the solid base, and then uh, up to um, the uh, um, in the prophets in the in the then it differs in the in the Jewish canon the prophets come immediately after Torah after the Pentateuch, whereas <clears throat> the Christian canons um, have historical books which you do not have in the Jewish canon, but the books that are there are in the Jewish canon, um, as you can see uh, Joshua Judges are solid right across the board. But then you have um, Samuel and Kings in the Jewish canon or the Tanakh. And <clears throat> I'd like to talk about that. If you'll keep your eyes now on the left list, the list on the left, the Jewish canon, you'll notice that Genesis through, if you want to put a line under Kings, that might help you if you have a pen or a pencil. Uh, because that's where the story stops. Beginning, the, the, the narrative starts with Genesis, creation, call of the patriarchs, matriarchs, and so on. 
and the promises to Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 12 that if they will go on a trip with this God who speaks to them uh, <clears throat> about this, uh, they, according to the text, um, then um, he will give them um, a land, place to live, and progeny, numerous descendants, to be as numerous as the sand particles of the seashore and the stars in the heavens. That's a lot of kids. And, and so they accept that, but then they grow old rather rapidly <laughs> in Genesis 13, 14, 15. And in 15, then, Abraham fusses with God and says, uh, uh, look, you promised us a lot of kids and we don't have any. We, and uh, forget where we, place to live, we're nomads, but, but uh, we don't have any kids, what are you gonna do about that? So God says, okay, we'll make another covenant. And so they have a, what's called the covenant between the pieces. In Genesis 15, they take the, the carcasses of the, of the sacrificial animals, cut them in two, and a torch goes between them. That's the symbol for the covenant that's renewed, as it were, and renewing the promise of progeny. And then, and that's Genesis 15, and then Genesis 16 comes, and you have an, you have an annunciation to Hagar about Ishmael. Well, is that really what we wanted? The Arabs are going to have, they're going to have the promises? Oh my heavens. Well, but there you are. The Hagar and Ishmael come first. Then Genesis 17 and 18, and you have a duplicate. And, and so one we call J, the other P, E, it doesn't matter, uh, <coughs> sources. And there the promises are made to Sarah and to Abraham. Well, my God, Abraham is 99 and she's 90. And they say, look, get real. Well, how can you, this isn't going to work. We're too old. And she's, you know, she's menopause and gone, beyond. And so they say, it doesn't matter. Uh, you'll, have a, you'll have a child about this time next year. Well, lo and behold, she did. And this time it's Isaac. And Yitzchak is the Hebrew name for Isaac. He laughs because when the Annunciation is made to Abraham, he falls on his face. Well, that's fine. That's a position of great piety. You've seen Muslims with their prayer rugs and so on. And laughs. Laughs at God. He doesn't believe it at all. Not for a moment. How can this be? But Isaac comes. She does get pregnant. Isaac comes. Don't ask how or why. I mean, it's a, it's a miracle, okay? What it emphasizes is that Isaac the second generation of the called people of God was a gift of God. Don't ask about how biology works. It's not the point. The point is Isaac was a gift of God, just as every generation of the called people of God is a gift of God. And <clears throat> lo and behold, we go along, and, and, I, and Abraham apparently forgets that Isaac was a gift. And so God says, oh gee, I have to ask him back. So he meets with, with uh, in Genesis 22, he meets with Abraham and says, I'm gonna have to ask you to sacrifice Isaac. You don't get the point. Abraham had forgotten that Isaac was a gift. So God asked him back. Abraham being very faithful and jarred apparently into reality of this thing, uh, <clears throat> he and Isaac go for it on a trip and go to Mount Moriah, which turns out to be where Jerusalem is. And, and, uh, and there they, uh, he prepares to sacrifice Isaac. Genesis 22. And they, they go up the mountain together and Isaac says, we have the wood and we have the uh, fire to light it. What about the lamb? Oh, God will provide. God will provide. So they get up to it. He doesn't even tell Isaac that he's the one who's going to be sacrificed, but then he has to put him on the altar. Binds him onto this. He builds an altar first. And if you, if you, you see, you're, we're supposed to read this story every year. 
And as we get a little older, we begin to understand a little more about it. And in synagogue, you read it every year. And we learn a little better each time what's actually going on. And, and uh, I, Abraham builds the altar stone by stone, rejecting, I'm sure, half of them, uh, not wanting to finish, of course. He does finish. He binds Isaac to the altar, raises the knife to, to, to uh, effect the sacrifice, and God's uh, a lamb appears in the thicket, and a voice comes from heaven, don't touch the lad, don't do anything to him for whatever. Now I know you understand. Because, you see, that story, by the way, could, could be the story of the whole Bible. God gives us gifts, and we forget that they are gifts. We think that they're ours. I used to be a Presbyterian, and uh, I, I wear this to remind people that I'm Episcopalian, but I used to be Presbyterian, and I preached in some pretty large churches in the country, Fourth Presbyterian in Chicago, Village Church in Kansas, um, <clears throat> 8,000 members of the, of the, and I would, during the sermon, I would lean over the, the microphone sometimes and say, do you know, no, not here at Fourth Church, I'm sure, but I know some Presbyterians who think they own something. I, I do, I know, I actually know some Presbyterians who think they own something in this brief passage from uh, cradle to grave, from uh, womb to tomb. In this very short life between sperm and worm, uh, between, <laughs> between erection and resurrection, I actually know some people <laughs> who think they own something. We deceive ourselves always in the thinking we own something. And, um, the story goes on, moves on to fulfillment of the promises, glorious fulfillment of the promises in 1 Kings 10. Solomon is king, and the kingdom of Israel and Judah, the United Kingdom, spreads throughout Palestine and beyond. And um, the Queen of Sheba comes for a visit to um, recognize that Abraham, that Solomon has the most glorious kingdom you can imagine. Uh, and, and so he says to, uh, she appreciates his wisdom. That was what a later generation understood it to be. But here you have the great Queen of Sheba coming to recognize the fulfillment of those promises. Because those promises are fulfilled. Progeny and a place to live. And, and um, uh, it's, by the way, when, the, in, it, when in the Christmas story we read about the three kings from the east, one of them is from Saba, which is the same as Sheba. Because the New Testament, by the way, is in large part a midrash on the old. <clears throat> don't, don't tell the bishop that, but, the, but uh, that's, it's really true. Um, uh, they, the, if, 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 if the, if the Queen of Sheba goes and recognizes what God has done, all the more so what God has done through Christ. Not only just one king from Saba, but three kings. It's called Calva Homer in, in rabbinic parlance, or argumentum a fortiori. If it happens in the First Testament, all the more so in the second. For instance, uh, we just had the reading of the 4,000, 5,000, uh, how many of us would have benefited, uh, how much we would have benefited if we read 2 Kings 4? When Elijah provides food for a hundred soldiers and much of the food, and when they, didn't, when they had only a few pieces to, to offer, but a lot is left over once Elijah provides them. If Elijah could do it, all the more so Jesus could. If he could feed a hundred, Jesus could feed 5,000. It's Calva Homer. It's all the more so. <clears throat> well, that's jumping ahead a little bit, but the, but the promises are fulfilled according to uh, uh, 1 Kings 10, and then beginning with 1 Kings 11, oh man, it is all downhill. All downhill. 
It shows Solomon didn't really understand very well. He's got uh, how many wives did he have? 300. 300 wives. 700 assistant wives. <laughs> Concubines. Concu uh, assistant wives. And um, uh, I mean, he, 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 he you know, it's, it's fulfilled. And, but beginning in 1 Kings 11, oh man, it's downhill all the way to the end of Second Kings, Northern Kingdom is destroyed, the Southern Kingdom is by Assyria, and the Southern Kingdom is destroyed by Babylonia. It's all gone, all gone. And many are taken into exile in Babylonia. And there they sit down and weep. They hang their harps upon the trees, according to Psalm 137, because they remember Zion. Well, what happens then in exile? They're there three generations. Three generations. Say, 60 years they're there. They have plenty of time to recognize that what they had and is now gone was a gift of God. That they had misinterpreted in thinking that they owned something. That they owned the land. That they owned the place, the, what they had. And now they realize they don't. Do you remember what Václav Havel and Nelson Mandela said after Mandela had been in prison for 18 years in Robbins Island and, Mende and Havel almost the same amount in, in, um, uh, in Czechoslovakia. And, and, and when they were, got out, they both said the same thing. When you have nothing, then you realize that all life is a gift of God. But does it, does, do we have to have nothing before we realize that? Maybe if we, if we go to church once a week, we might be able to remember it. Maybe not have to wait until we're gone. The book of Job you're studying, I understand. The third chapter of the book of Job is the famous lament by, the, by Job, in which he makes two principal points about death. Because he wishes for it, he wants it. He's miserable. Everything has been taken away. And he thought that he was, you know, he, he was pretty, he was, just read uh, Job 29. He, he, was, he, was, he was right up there. He, he was, uh, honored, he had all kinds of uh, awards, he had all kinds of riches, and it's all gone. And so he has time to think. And one of the thoughts that he has is that death is very democratic. It's gonna happen to all of us. You see, that's the reserve that God makes for herself. As rich as we get, as as advanced as we think we are, God has one trump, one ace. We're all going to die. So death is very democratic. And do we have to wait for death to remember that life was a gift? Very democratic in terms of we're all going to do it, but it's also very democratic in the fact that Maggots and grave worms do not care one whit whether you were a prince or a pauper. Democratic in two senses. Well, the story goes on then after kings and the utter destruction of the northern kingdom and by Assyria and the southern kingdom by Babylonia. Oh, you have the, the, the power flows list. I just wanted you to have that in case you weren't too familiar with what happened in the Iron Age especially to that part of Palestine, to that part of the Near East. Okay, after kings in the Jewish canon, after kings, you have 15 prophets. Three major ones after kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then 12 so-called minor ones. And what do they do principally? 
they explain why God let the disaster happen. That's a shock for most Christians because look at where the prophets are in the Christian canons, and all of them. They put last. Why are they put last? Because Christians want to emphasize that the Bible promises Jesus is coming. Messiah is coming. And so Christians put it last, but in the Jewish canon, it's correctly after kings because those 15 case histories that those prophets represent explain why God could let his people be destroyed. Why did he fulfill the promises and then they're destroyed? Why? And the prophets give the answer. It's because God is bigger than you thought. I don't care how big you think God is, God is bigger than that. And if you have to think day by day how much bigger God is than you thought the day before. And so they explain. Amos says in chapter 9, verse 7, You're, aren't you like the Ethiopians to me? I brought the Philistines from Kephter and the Syrians from Kephter. So you had a migration. You make big stuff out of being liberated from Egypt. I did the same for the Philistines and for the, and for the uh, uh, Syrians. So you had a creation. You glorify yourselves in talking about the Exodus. They had an Exodus too. And I was in charge. I mean, our God is their God? Oh, how could that be? You see, because we all still think tribally, even, even we Christians, we have a master who taught us. Jesus was the monotheizer par excellence. More than e even the prophets saying, love your enemy. But the prophets had been saying that all along. You've got to understand that the, the one God of all is the God of our enemy as well as our God. Well, what's the use of being a Christian if we can't have some exclusivity? I mean, there's got to be some, you know, we've got to have some fraternity that's better than another one or something. I mean, it's you is. It's hard to give up tribalism. Very hard. How are we going to move along from a Christocentric theology to a theocentric Christology. And that's what we'll be talking about in the next couple of weeks. But that's anticipating a little bit. We, we want to look some more at what they were doing. So you have two major differences between the Jewish canon and the Christian canons. And the one is that the prophets are replaced by the Christians to be last because they are to the principal. The, when we have readings from the First Testament, please notice nearly all of them point toward the New Testament. Nearly all of them point toward Christ. But that's not the value of the prophet. The prophet's value is to say that God is bigger than you think. God is the God of your enemies as well as yourselves. God is the God of... You mean, I mean, for instance, Jeremiah would say that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, who's about to destroy their city and deport them to Babylonian prison and war camps, and he says to them that, <clears throat> that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, was God's servant. How big is this God? It gets bigger all the time. And that's the point. He's bigger even than we're thinking today. We Christians, by the doctrine of the Incarnation, have fooled ourselves into thinking that Jesus contained God. And that is, that is wrong. 
just plain wrong. I was about to say heresy, but it's worse than that. It's just plain wrong. Jesus didn't, that, it, it, you know what that becomes for the Christian? It's my understanding of Jesus has got God limited and in a box. And the Bible is here, unless we, of course, arrange it so that it doesn't say what it really says. God is around to tell us that God loves us, but, but we don't contain her in any of our boxes, any of them, whatever. Well, the other difference is that the Christian canons, you notice, have historical books. The Jewish canon doesn't have that, that division. The Jewish canon has simply Torah and Prophets, which is mentioned in Luke 24. It's mentioned the prologue to Ecclesiasticus. It's mentioned Torah and Prophets. That's the basic canon of, the, of, the, uh, of Judaism until after the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome. And you get the writings then. But in the Christian canons, notice that there's a section called historical books that's not in the Jewish canon. Now, all this has to do with the First Testament only, just the, not the Second Testament. But in the historical books, you'll notice that the Protestant canon puts Ruth up there and Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther up there because they're trying to to stretch the history down as far as, look at, look at uh, the Roman Catholic that goes down to Second Maccabees in the, in the uh, uh, third and second century BC. Uh, also in the case, uh, in, in, um, in uh, the, look at the Ethiopian Orthodox canon, it goes all the way down to third Maccabee. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you have a historical section? Because it makes it easier to understand this radical idea, almost heretical, to add to the Bible. Add what? Gospel and Acts. If you stretch it down as far as possible, then you can understand that you could add the story of God's work in Jesus. Now, we Christians fully believe that God did work in Jesus in a very special way. But we must not, by a doctrine of incarnation, think that our concept of Christ boxes God into that concept. That is heresy. Oh, I don't like to use the word heresy. That's just wrong. It, 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 it won't work. No box that we can create will contain God. She's much bigger than you'll ever think. So there are the two major differences that I wanted us to look at about the, uh, about, uh, the canon. Now I'd like for us to, uh, we have, I, we have until when? About quarter time, about 15 Okay, great. I'd like to have a little time for questions. But I especially want, I want next Sunday for us to start with questions because I would like for you to think about those, this is, these radical ideas, which are, by the way, just simply biblical ideas, um, to think about them and then bring questions at the beginning of the section next time. But we'll have time for some questions today. But before we do so, let's, let's uh, look at some of the names of God that we have in the First Testament. Um, uh, you, you have in Genesis 14, we have the expression Magain Avram. The, oh, these are my notes too, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I, 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 gave you, I gave you just enough to whet your appetite. <laughs> oh good. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you look at Genesis 14, we don't need to go there, you see the expression shield of Abraham. Well, William Albright, following his masters, determined to saw that that really was the ancient god of the nomadic person called Abraham. That his god was the shield of Abraham, Magain Avram. And then you have in, in Genesis 31, the god of Isaac, Pachad Yitzchak, the fear of Isaac. 
And then in Genesis 49, the God of Jacob, the mighty one of Jacob, Avir Yaakov. You see, if, if you look at these stories about these three nomadic groups, the Abrahamic group, the Isaac group, and the Jacob group, uh, they are presented in the Bible in the final editions as being three different generations that, that um, um, Isaac was the child of Abraham and Jacob the child of Isaac and so on. But actually they were three different nomadic groups from in the, in the ancient Near East. And they get read all together as three generations. But if you look at all these various names of gods that we have, for instance, you have um, Ael, which is a, 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 a Northwest Semitic god. We see that in the Ugar Ugaritic tablets. Baal, which was a Canaanite god. Asherah, a Canaanite god. Um, and you have uh, Ael Koneh, which is re-pronounced re in Genesis, in Exodus 20 as Ael uh, Kana, meaning the jealous one. The original meaning was Kone, Ael Kone, creator god, one who creates, a variant name or verb for create. Um, El Roe in Genesis 16, the god who is a seer god. The, and then you have the wonderful expression in Genesis 13, El Elohe Yisrael, the god of the gods of Israel. I don't know how that's translated in the various translations. Would somebody do, does somebody have a Bible? Oh, we're Episcopalians, we only have a Book of Common Prayer. Um, uh, uh, Genesis thirty-three twenty. You have one, uh, uh, Genesis thirty-three twenty. I don't know how the various translations translate that. I had, had a student who once remarked after looking at the Bible probably for the first time that it was stealing from the Book of Common Prayer. <laughs> there he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Yisrael. The RSV has the just transliteration. What does it have in the NRSV? Looking. It's never been opened before a sticky page. <laughs> Don't tell the Presbyterians down the street. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, oh. 3320. The last verse of 33. After Jesus came, after Jacob came from Padam Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan. 3320? Yeah. 3320. Yeah, you're getting there. Oh, 20, okay. There he erected an altar. And called it El Elohim. El Elohe Elohe. That that's huh? also, also true in the New International Version. There he set up an altar and he calls it an Elohe Israel. Call it what? An Elohe Israel. Yeah. So they're good. Well they they left it they just transliterated it. But the translation would be the God of the gods of Israel. That's telling right there. Uh, in other words, you, you begin to have already in the text, which wonderfully preserves some of these ancient names, but what you have is a, a beginning amalgamation of, of them into one. The monotheizing process is started at that point. And they, they, want, the, they, they want this, this God to be called Yahweh. Uh, yod He vav He is the most common name for God that we have in the First Testament. It is always translated as Lord. I think that's right. It is in the RSV and the NRSV and, and the NAB. Those are the ones that I was at least on the translation committees of NRSV and NAB and I know that they, they <clears throat> do so. But um, the, uh, uh, the, the point that we want to keep in mind is that they uh, Yahweh is not pronounced Yahweh, it's pronounced Lord. And what you have is small caps, large L and then small O cap, small R cap, and small D cap. 
not, not the regular Lord like, like a title, but rather the name. His name is Lord. And so we inherit that in Christianity. We speak of God the Lord. <clears throat> so, but, the, but the point is that Yahweh began and to be the name under which all these various gods that we just mentioned, and many others, are gathered into one. And, <clears throat> and um, uh, it, the, uh, uh, where does Yahweh come from? Probably a mountain god, and maybe Sinai. Sinai means belonging to the moon god Sin, S-I-N. And that's located uh, in, in somewhere in the, in the um, <clears throat> uh, uh, area of uh, the Negev or, or in the area of, of uh, between Egypt and Palestine. It's difficult to know exactly where. But, <clears throat> but um, uh, the original Yahweh would have been a mountain god and represented by fire and smoke, and you have those as reduced to being God, of being guides of the Israelites in their escape from Egypt for the 40 years in the wilderness. Column of fire by day, uh, uh, night and column of smoke by day guide them. But they were originally probably representing this mountain God from the Sinai. And uh, <clears throat> also represented by the bull horns, which would be represented by a, half, a quarter moon, and all such things. You have various attempts, but particularly by the Swedish scholars in the 20th century. We're not sure about all of them. It doesn't matter. The point is that Yafi began to be the one who collects all of these other gods, so that when you read the word Lord with the small caps, that is Yahweh in your Bible, and that is the God under whom, under whose aegis, all these others are gathered eventually in the monotheistic process. But the monotheistic process is, is far more important than that. We started already to talk about it in terms of what the prophets were saying to the people, namely that the God of their enemies was their God as well. And the, that the commandant of the Babylonian forces coming to destroy Israel and uh, Judah and the city of Jerusalem, that God actually was Yahweh. You can call him by other names, but that God was really our God, and their God is our God. That's the, that's the, that's the point at which the whole Bible takes a significant turn. Now, you have in 621, before the destruction of Jerusalem, you have a little reformation take place in the south under, the, under King Josiah uh, for a kind of ecumenical movement for Yahweh. And so you have the Shema coming out of that in Genesis 6-4. <clears throat> Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, which should be translated, the Lord our, I don't know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, uh, the Lord our God is one Lord, or Yahweh our God is one Yahweh. What do you mean one Yahweh? There were many Yahvehs out in the countryside, and where they had altars built at all the various hillocks and hills. And Josiah wanted to gather them all into one place so that you have the book of Deuteronomy as expression of the Josianic Reformation, which was a monotheizing movement to bring all the Yahvees together. Part of the monotheizing process. <clears throat> but the main part of the monotheizing process is what we have already looked at and hinted at it rather with the prophets and that is they're trying to say to the people that the, the God of our enemies attacking us is our God because there's only one. Now that movement uh, Jeremiah said after uh, the first deportation took place Jeremiah sent a letter 
to the exiles in Babylonia, those that had taken place prior to this. We'll see you later, Cindy. Um, uh, <clears throat> Jeremiah had said that uh, uh, in a letter that he sent to the, to the um, exiles, to their first deportation in five, <clears throat> probably 597, 596, uh, first deportation, and he said to them, pray for Babylonia, pray for Babylon, because in their welfare will be your welfare. So you have pray for your enemy way before the New Testament. You have it already in Jeremiah. You actually have it in most of these prophets in one way or another. Because why, <clears throat> now that we're, we're, let's ask this question and we'll spend some time in the next two weeks on it. Why were these prophets, why were these writings the ones that got into a canon? Israel had far more literature than the Bible. Ancient Israel, I mean. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Book of Chronicles cites 32 different ancient writings that we don't have. But the book of the Acts of Solomon, the book of the Acts of Yahweh, the book of the Wars of Yahweh, many other books. Where are they? Well, apparently they didn't get picked up again. But these that we have were picked up again, you see. Because what becomes canonical? Not a bunch of white-haired old men sitting around the table saying, oh, that, that, that'll be in our canon now, that will be out, and that will be... No, 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 no. What, what gets into a canon is that which helped the people in crisis. So that what we have in these books are books, when they got to the to, uh, destitution, when they got to the prison of war camps, and like Václav Havel, and Nelson Mandela, they found that they had been fooled by thinking they owned something. That they got to those places and they began to realize, where, 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 where is that fellow around here that, that used to recite that guy that we hated, got, oh, his name was Amos or something. Where is that? Let's listen to him again. Let's hear it again. Because now we have ears to hear and eyes to see when we are fooled by thinking that we own something. And so they would listen to these various prophets again that they hated in the pre-war days when they had their possessions in, in hand. But when they were, got to Babylonia and they had nothing, then they could hear them. They could hear them. I remember walking along Riverside Drive once with Eugene Nida, one of the most brilliant single persons I've ever met. He was the head of the translations department for the United Bible Societies, principally in New York and Stuttgart. And I worked for him and with him for about 20 years. But one day we were walking along Riverside Drive, <clears throat> and I, I, I don't know if you've ever walked in New York along any drive, but, but what can you hear? You hear cars, you hear trains, you hear planes, you hear noises. We're walking along Riverside Drive and he says, did you hear that? I said, Gene, what do you mean? Did I hear what? <laughs> I hear a lot of things. He said, no, that bird. I said, what bird? I didn't hear any bird. But he had heard the bird. He had ears to hear. Well, he did that by, by being an ornithologist of the first water. But uh, what I'm talking about is the ability to hear and to see when you're not deceived by thinking that you own something. We're stewards, that's all, and for a short while. And uh, <clears throat> I got, I just turned 90, well now I'm gonna be 91 next month, but I don't think it should take that long <laughs> <laughs> to, to understand that we don't really own it. We, we live in deception. We're stewards. One of the wonderful things that, and I probably shouldn't end on this note, but 
wonderful, wonderful things about that American Baptist named John D. Rockefeller, Jr. He had five sons, Nelson, Lawrence, I don't know the names of all of them, David. They were taught in their American Baptist Sunday school classes and by their father that they didn't own anything, that all the wealth that they had, they were stewards. And those five boys gave nearly everything to making New York what it is today. Not only Rockefeller Center, Lincoln Center, the Twin Towers. I mean, it's hard to imagine most of anything that they didn't themselves give. Now, <clears throat> they kept a lot for themselves. There's no doubt about it. And I'm not, I'm not issuing them as models for any of us. <laughs> Believe me, you have to have a lot of money for them to be models of anything. But I do think that it's possible for us to teach our children that they don't really own anything. It's very deceiving to think we do. And to learn from these prophets, not what the Christian canon leaves you to think that is simply predicting Christ. No, no, no. They, they learned to tell their people in times when they had nothing, that in effect they had everything they needed, absolutely everything. And <clears throat> um, I don't want to glorify poverty. That's not the point at all. I'm not asking you to give up anything. I'm not asking you to make a big write out a big check for anything. I'm just asking you to understand that we are but stewards of whatever amount we have. And we are, should be faithful stewards of that. Um, we have a long way to go yet, but we have two more Sundays. But any questions? <clears throat> well, it must be a hundred questions, but anybody daring to ask one? <laughs> Jim, this, this is so me it's bringing me back to the student days when I was in your classes oh. years ago. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving your words about the shape of the canon and uh, the monophasing process. And it reminds me of a book someone once wrote called God Has a Story Too. <laughs> and you might understand that uh, the if it's God's story, then um, there's everyone is part of that story. Yes. Without exception. Yes. Which instantly undermines our tendency toward the tribalism yes. that would have, well, those others are not part of God's story. Right. And the shape of the canon, which is, and this is what you've done today, to remind us it's a story. The shape of that story does not exclude anyone by its oh. very telling. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. He speak, he's referring to a book that, of sermons that I did years ago. I've forgotten when. 87, was it? Something like that. Well, what do you always say? About how do you read the scriptures first? What, what? You theologize before you moralize. Oh, yes. Yes, theologize before moralizing. In fact, it would be good to try to, not to moralize for a whole year. Just try, you know. <laughs> uh, our evangelical friends tend to, and I was brought up in the evangelical situation totally and completely, but there's a tendency to moralize, um, and usually about others. Um, what we want to learn to do is to theologize. That is to say, to understand how big God is, much bigger than we can think, and that this is a very small, pitiful little planet. It's getting smaller all the time. And we're talking about a God who created all of it, every bit of it. And we inhabit one little bitty speck. And we should try to keep that in mind at all times. When we're, when we're, we tend to want to, to condemn somebody else for something. Just remember. And also, let's remember, we'll bring this up more as we go along, but but also, we don't want to moralize about why those Germans supported Hitler and condemn them for doing so. On the contrary, they provide mirrors for us to understand how a leader might arise with extreme nationalist tendencies 
to want to say that we are the people God chose. And we have to be careful of that, very careful. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's important to try to resist the moralizing and to learn how to theologize. And if you do try to theologize, please monotheize while you're doing so. And let's learn from others what God wants us to know and not restrict ourselves <clears throat> to what we think is God's gifts to us. You refer to God as a her or a she. Is that deliberate? Is that? You refer to God as a her or a she. No, all, you see, you can't talk about God except by metaphors. Right. All that, that metaphor. Yeah, but what the church has had a tendency to do for 2,000 years is to raise metaphor to the level of doctrine. What I want us to do is to reduce those doctrines back to the level of metaphor and the power of the metaphor. And therefore, it makes no difference if you say he or she. There's no gender involved with God. We say God the Father and so on, but those are metaphors. And if we just remember that they're metaphors, they're wonderful metaphors. It's beautiful to think of God as a parent, but, but we, we must not absolutize it into the level of doctrine. Thank you. Any, any other, any little sermon you want to preach? Because <laughs> I, 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 I preached about four this morning so far. Yeah. Yes. About what you're saying about memorializing. You know, the classes we've been talking about the fundamentalist and having to deal with it sometimes. It's easy then for us to get in, in that other side and be uncomfortable with what they're saying and doing the same thing. Moralizing because they're moralizing towards us. Mm -hmm. And I, so I appreciate what you're saying and we need to come back. Thank you. So, what is the schedule now? Church. Church is at 10? 10. Thank you, Jennifer.